Hi there, this is Phil Simborg reporting uh, from back in Chicago. Had a wonderful, great, exciting weekend in San Antonio. Beautiful city, beautiful hotel, wonderfully well-run tournament. Something I'll definitely be going back to is almost everybody I talked to said, um, when I say almost, the only ones that weren't sure uh, were saying they weren't sure uh, what tournaments they're going to, but they know that San Antonio is going to be high on their list. It was a great event in many ways. It was particularly exciting to see the number one, two, three, four, and five giants in the world there competing in Dual Duel, where they were playing for PR, and to see Akiko beat all the giants, clearly proving she's uh, one of the best women players in the world, if not the best. She came all the way from Japan to win that event, beating Matt cohen in the finals. In one of the early rounds, Matt cohen played at less than one PR proving why he's one of the giants in the world. Falafel beat me. That proves why he's one of the best players in the world, although he had a roll a double three on the last roll on an eight cube to beat me, but I still enjoyed it, and he was a great gentleman about it and uh, wonderful to spend time with him as well. Um, this is a position that came up in a lesson that uh, John O'Hagan and I uh, gave this evening to one of my students. Uh, the lesson is on a subject called action cubes. This is an action cube situation. An action cube is one of those highly volatile situations where the equities can swing tremendously in one play, and it often can be very hard to know whether to double or not. You certainly don't want to miss a double when you have one because, for example, if red does very well here and performs and hits off the bar and he's red's on roll, uh, you could lose your market by quite a bit. How about if he rolls a 3-1? <laughs> you know, how about if he just rolls a 3 and white dances and then red picks up the other one? He's going to be very sorry he didn't double because of all the gamins. There's some really great things that can happen here. Um, that's the glass, glass is half full side. The glass is half empty. Is What if red doesn't come in? What if 25% of the time he rolls a combination of 2, 5, and 6? What if he comes in with a 1-6? What if he comes in with a 1-5? What if he comes in with a double one, comes in and not hits? So this is a double-edged sword, and a sword it is, because it's going to cut. It's going to hurt whether you come in well and hit, or it's going to hurt somebody. Let's say that. One of the things I like about backgammon, one of my favorite sayings, every roll makes somebody happy. So somebody's going to be happy after this roll. But how do you decide whether or not to double or not? Well, uh, we have a process that we teach at the Backgammon Learning Center. Myself, John O'Hagan, Stick, Perry, David Rockwell. Our process is this. First, you need to know your take point, your price of gammons, and that of your opponent. Look at the score and see what the situation is and what kind of cube action you normally need to take. Well, this is what we call a normal match score. It's very much like money or unlimited games. The take points are generally about 25% on the dead cube and about 21 and a half on a live cube. Gammon values are about 0.5. With that in mind, if I'm red and I'm thinking of doubling, the first question is Woolsey's law. If I if I were him, would I take or drop? Again, the answer is I'm not quite sure. I think I would take, or I'm not quite sure. I think I might drop. Then for sure it's a double. But if the answer is I'm sure I'm dropping, then for sure it's a double unless you got too many gammas and you're too good to take. And then lastly, if you're pretty sure it's a take, then we got some more work to do. Well, in this situation, if you were white, would you take or drop? Well, it's scary. It is scary, but you got to take these cubes. You can't let this go. You might still win if you get hit. And if you don't get hit, wow. If you don't get hit, what kind of a game have you got here? I mean, you got a big game if you don't get hit here. So this looks pretty exciting, uh, you know, to to take this cube. Got to be pretty much of a chicken if you're not going to take this cube. How, let's do some estimates. How often do you get gammon compared to how often you win games if things go your way? It's really very close to the same. How about winning chances? It's really close to 50-50. Believe it or not, this is about as close as you can get to a 50-50 game. So if you're assessing this game properly, white will take. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have a double. 
Red may well have a double here, but the first clue that it's not a double, and by the way, this isn't, your first clue is what I just said. It's about a 50-50 game with about gammons about even. If you're that far away from a drop, or that far away from 21.5%, it's very hard to justify a double. So that's right there a major reason. But another thing you can do is market losers because that's the main reason you should ever double if you think your opponent is taking. If you think you're going to lose your market too much on the next roll, you should double. Why is it wrong to double too soon? There's three major reasons why. Number one, you're giving him the cube, which is a huge weapon that he can use on you if things go his way. And now if things go his way, you're going to lose two points instead of one. Or you might lose even more if it goes really far his way. Or he might redouble you when you have a take. And you might have to take this cube, and now you're going to lose four points instead of one because you made the mistake of giving the cube too soon. What's the other two reasons why it's wrong to give the cube too soon? Because it didn't gain you a thing if you don't have enough market losers. If he's probably going to take next time anyway, you're doing something that gets you nothing, that gives you no benefit, but can hurt you. But the third reason it's wrong to give a cube too soon is it's very unlikely that he's going to drop. And if you can't get a mistake out of your opponent, or very rarely get a mistake out of your opponent by doubling when it's really early, compared to waiting a little bit longer when it's still maybe a take and he might make a mistake and drop. By the way, you could even lose your market. Maybe it's right to drop and he might make a mistake and take. Either way, he makes a mistake, you gain equity. And the odds of that happening are much better if you wait until a more appropriate time to double, when it's closer to his take point. There's another very excellent approach to cubing at normal match scores, and that's O'Hagan's Law of Market Losers. Do I, am I going to lose my market 25% of the time? Well, you count the number of times you lose your market, and you subtract from that what happens the other rolls. In this case, if you do hit, and if you were to lose your market by hitting, and I'm not sure you do all the time, sometimes you might even have a small take after you hit, because remember, before your next roll, he gets the roll. He might be able to come in and hit you back. He might come in and get out. There's all kinds of things that could happen good to him to where he'd still have a take next time, even if you hit. But if you don't hit, we know instantly that 25% of the time you're in big trouble. If you dance here, those are really all anti-market losers. Why is it an anti-market loser? Because you don't even have a take if you dance here. There's no way. Let me just show, prove that to you first of all. That's part of the projection you got to have. Let's say that red dances. Now it's white's roll. Let's give white the cube. Because let's say you had doubled him. He's too good to redouble by only a little bit. It's very close. But you've got a big, big drop. And of course, if the cube's in the middle, it's going to be a clear double and a clear pass. So you can't afford, you've got to take into account that nine rolls, you're a loser. And even if you have these 20 numbers that hit plus a 1, 2, and a 1, 3, there's 24 numbers that hit. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Twos and threes already hit. So 1, 2, and 1, 3 didn't add anymore. There's only 20 numbers that hit. Um, and even if you have those 20 market losers, you've got to immediately take off the nine. And then you're assuming that those hits all lose your market. Well, this is the thinking you should go through. And you should estimate wins, gammons, and so on. See if you're close to what I came up with as far as being a 50-50 game. And as far as the gammons being even and around this number. That way, if you're wrong, you'll know where you went wrong. So now that you've seen these numbers, you see why this is not a double. Could this ever be a double? Well, sure. Let's take a look at the, our favorite score, two away, four away. There's a huge incentive to double when you're four away and your opponent's two away. One of the incentives is he's winning. You got needs. You probably should gamble a little bit when he only needs two points to win the match. If you double and you and you're wrong and he ends up winning two points instead of one point, you haven't given away that much equity because he's going to. Uh, go to Crawford if he wins one point, and it's going to be one away, four away Crawford. You've got to win three games. You're, what, 18% there? And you have to 
uh, so you, if you if you're wrong, you're only going to give up 18 percent. So uh, yeah, it's 18. I'm struggling here. 18 and a half, I think is it, it is. So you're only giving up about 18 and a half if you make a mistake. That's one reason. But another reason, and a very big reason, is his gammons are now worth 1.0, not 0.5 anymore. Your gammons now are worth zero. So you had those even gammons before. And instead of having a zero net balance on the gammon value, he's now got a minus 16 for the gammon values. His take point is 20%. And clearly, he has a big take. If he's, if he's going to win the game half the time, and you take off those 16 gammons, that's still 34%, and his take points 20%. So how can this be a double? No way, right? Well, it is. It's so volatile. You lose your market so much, and you win those 16 gammons worth 1.0 when you hit. And if you don't double and you hit, you lose your market way too often. And, and you lose your market big time. So because of the volatility, because it's an action cube at two-way, four-way, it's a double. Do you really lose your market? Let's say you come in and hit just one checker, uh, three, two, and blue and white doesn't come in on his next roll. Have we lost our market? Absolutely. You're too good to double. That's how much you've lost your market. You're sick you didn't double. What if he came in? What if he came in with a with a one, three. Let's say he cleared the lot. Still a pass. So if he dances, you're too good. If he just comes in, it's probably a pass. You really do lose your market. All of those 20 hits. So it's possible you don't. He could come back in with a double one, double two. There's a couple of times you don't lose your market. So action doubles require study. They require looking at it much more deeply, estimating wins and gammons, counting market losers if your opponent has a take, but we still use the same basic theory. Know your take points and price of gammons. Use Woolsey's law. If you think it's a take, use O'Hagan's law. You might use Simborg's law here. I'm very proud of my name is on Simborg's law. Ask yourself what you would like to see your opponent do if you were him and do the opposite. So put yourself in white shoes and say, would I really want him to double here? If you're not sure, this is what, this is our last point to look at. If you're not sure, would I really be want him to double here if I were him? And if the answer is no, usually you don't. But how strongly do you feel about it? If you feel strongly, you would be you would be thrilled not to be doubled. Then go ahead and double. And if you don't mind that much getting double, then maybe you should hold off. That's a good parameter too. Hope this taught you something. It taught me something. Every time I give a lesson, I learn something. Thanks for watching, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.